This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Firefly, June 29, 2006. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 24 The Pavilion. At nine o'clock, D'Artagnan was at the Hotel des Gardes. He found Planchet already. The fourth horse had arrived. Planchet was armed with his musketoon and a pistol. D'Artagnan had his sword and placed two pistols in his belt, then both mounted and departed quietly. It was quite dark, and no one saw them go out. Planchet took place behind his master, and kept at a distance of ten paces from him. D'Artagnan crossed the quays, went out by the gate of La Conference, and followed the road, much more beautiful then than it is now, which leads to St. Cloud. As long as he was in the city, Planchet kept at the respectful distance he had imposed upon himself, but as soon as the road began to be more lonely and dark, he drew softly nearer, so that when they entered the Bois de Boulogne, he found himself riding quite naturally side by side with his master. In fact, we must not dissemble that the oscillation of the tall trees and the reflection of the moon in the dark underwood gave him serious uneasiness. D'Artagnan could not help perceiving that something more than usual was passing in the mind of his lackey, and said, "'Well, Monsieur Planchet, what is the matter with us now?' "'Don't you think, Monsieur, that woods are like churches?' "'How so, Planchet?' "'Because we dare not speak aloud in one or the other.' "'But why did you not dare to speak aloud, Planchet? "'Because you are afraid?' "'Afraid of being heard?' "'Yes, Monsieur.' "'Afraid of being heard! Why, there is nothing improper in our conversation, my dear Planchet, and no one could find fault with it.' "'Ah, monsieur,' replied Planchet, recurring to his besetting idea, "'that monsieur Bonacieux has something vicious in his eyebrows, and something very unpleasant in the play of his lips.' "'What the devil makes you think of Bonacieux?' "'Monsieur, we think of what we can, and not of what we will.' "'Because you are a coward, Planchet.' Monsieur, we must not confound prudence with cowardice. Prudence is a virtue. And you are very virtuous, are you not, Planchet? Monsieur, is not that the barrel of a musket which glitters yonder? Had we not better lower our heads? In truth, murmured D'Artagnan, to whom Monsieur de Treville's recommendation recurred, this animal will end by making me afraid. And he put his horse into a trot. Planchet followed the movements of his master, as if he had been his shadow, and was soon trotting by his side. "'Are we going to continue this pace all night?' asked Planchet. "'No, you are at your journey's end. How, monsieur? And you?' "'I am going a few steps farther. And monsieur leaves me here alone?' "'You are afraid, Planchet?' "'No, I only beg leave to observe to monsieur that the night will be very cold.' that chills bring on rheumatism, and that a lackey who has the rheumatism makes but a poor servant, particularly to a master as active as monsieur. Well, if you are cold, Planchet, you can go into one of those cabarets that you see yonder, and be in waiting for me at the door by six o'clock in the morning. Monsieur, I have eaten and drunk respectfully the crown you gave me this morning, so that I have not a sou left in case I should be cold. Here's half a pistole. Tomorrow morning— D'Artagnan sprang from his horse, threw the bridle to Planchet, and departed at a quick pace, folding his cloak around him. "'Good Lord, how cold I am!' cried Planchet, as soon as he had lost sight of his master, and in such haste was he to warm himself, that he went straight to a house set out with all the attributes of a suburban tavern, and knocked at the door. In the meantime, D'Artagnan, who had plunged into a by-path, continued his route and reached St. Cloud, but instead of following the main street, he turned behind the chateau, reached a sort of retired lane, and found himself soon in front of the pavilion named. It was situated in a very private spot. A high wall, at the angle of which was the pavilion, ran right along one side of this lane, and on the other was a little garden connected with a poor cottage which was protected by a hedge from passers-by. He gained the place appointed, and, as no signal had been given him by which to announce his presence, he waited. Not the least noise was to be heard. It might be imagined that he was a hundred miles from the capital. D'Artagnan leaned against the hedge, after having cast a glance behind it. Beyond that hedge, 
that garden, and that cottage, a dark mist enveloped with its folds that immensity where Paris slept, a vast void from which glittered a few luminous points, the funeral stars of that hell. But for D'Artagnan all aspects were clothed happily, all ideas wore a smile, all shades were diaphanous. The appointed hour was about to strike. In fact, at the end of a few minutes, the belfry of St. Cloud let fall slowly ten strokes from its sonorous jaws. There was something melancholy in this brazen voice pouring out its lamentations in the middle of the night, but each of those strokes, which made up the expected hour, vibrated harmoniously to the heart of the young man. His eyes were fixed upon the little pavilion, situated at the angle of the wall, of which all the windows were closed with shutters, except one on the first story. Through this window shone a mild light, which silvered the foliage of two or three linden trees which formed a group outside the park. There could be no doubt that behind this little window, which threw forth such friendly beams, that pretty Madame Bonacieux expected him. Wrapped in this sweet idea, D'Artagnan waited half an hour without the least impatience. His eyes fixed upon that charming little abode of which he could perceive a part of the ceiling, with its gilded mouldings, attesting the elegance of the rest of the apartment. The belfry of St. Cloud sounded half-past ten. This time, without knowing why, D'Artagnan felt a cold shiver run through his veins. Perhaps the cold began to affect him, and he took a perfectly physical sensation for a moral impression. Then the idea seized him that he had read incorrectly, and that the appointment was for eleven o'clock. He drew near to the window, and, placing himself so that a ray of light should fall upon the letter as he held it, he drew it from his pocket and read it again. But he had not been mistaken. The appointment was for ten o'clock. He went and resumed his post, beginning to be rather uneasy at this silence and this solitude. Eleven o'clock sounded. D'Artagnan began now really to fear that something had happened to Madame Bonacieux. He clapped his hands three times, the ordinary signal of lovers. But nobody replied to him, not even an echo. He then thought, with a touch of vexation, that perhaps the young woman had fallen asleep while waiting for him. He approached the wall and tried to climb it, but the wall had been recently pointed, and D'Artagnan could get no hold. At that moment he thought of the trees, upon whose leaves the light still shone, and as one of them drooped over the road, he thought that from its branches he might get a glimpse of the interior of the pavilion. The tree was easy to climb. Besides, D'Artagnan was but twenty years old, and consequently had not yet forgotten his schoolboy habits. In an instant he was among the branches, and his keen eyes plunged through the transparent panes into the interior of the pavilion. It was a strange thing, and one which made D'Artagnan tremble from the sole of his foot to the roots of his hair, to find that this soft light, this calm lamp, enlightened a scene of fearful disorder. One of the windows was broken. The door of the chamber had been beaten in and hung, split in two, on its hinges. A table, which had been covered with an elegant supper, was overturned. The decanters broken in pieces, and the fruits crushed, strewed the floor. Everything in the apartment gave evidence of a violent and a desperate struggle. D'Artagnan even fancied he could recognize amid this strange disorder fragments of garments, and some bloody spots staining the cloth and the curtains. He hastened to descend into the street, with a frightful beating at his heart. He wished to see if he could find other traces of violence. The little soft light shone on in the calmness of the night. D'Artagnan then perceived a thing that he had not before remarked, for nothing had led him to the examination, that the ground, trampled here and hoof-marked there, presented confused traces of men and horses. Besides, the wheels of a carriage, which appeared to have come from Paris, had made a deep impression in the soft earth, which did not extend beyond the pavilion, but turned again toward Paris. At length D'Artagnan, in pursuing his researches, found near the wall a woman's torn glove. This glove, wherever it had not touched the muddy ground, was of irreproachable odor. It was one of those perfumed gloves that lovers like to snatch from a pretty hand. As D'Artagnan pursued his investigations, a more abundant and more icy sweat rolled in large drops from his forehead. His heart was oppressed by a horrible anguish, his respiration was broken and short, and yet, he said, to reassure himself, that this pavilion perhaps had nothing in common with Madame Bonacieux, that the young woman had made an appointment with him before the pavilion and not in the pavilion, that she might have been detained in Paris by her duties, or perhaps by the jealousy of her husband. 
But all of these reasons were combated, destroyed, overthrown, by that feeling of intimate pain which, on certain occasions, takes possession of our being, and cries to us so as to be understood, unmistakably, that some great misfortune is hanging over us. Then D'Artagnan became almost wild. He ran along the high road, took the path he had before taken, and, reaching the ferry, interrogated the boatman. About seven o'clock in the evening the boatman had taken over a young woman, wrapped in a black mantle, who appeared to be very anxious not to be recognized. But entirely on account of her precautions, the boatman had paid more attention to her, and discovered that she was young and pretty. There were then, as now, a crowd of young and pretty women who came to St. Cloud, and who had reasons for not being seen. And yet D'Artagnan did not for an instant doubt that it was Madame Bonacieux whom the boatman had noticed. D'Artagnan took advantage of the lamp which burned in the cabin of the ferry to read the billet of Madame Bonacieux once again, and satisfy himself that he had not been mistaken, that the appointment was at St. Cloud and not elsewhere, before the Destres Pavilion and not in another street. Everything conspired to prove to D'Artagnan that his presentiments had not deceived him, and that a great misfortune had happened. He again ran back to the chateau. It appeared to him that something might have happened at the pavilion in his absence, and that fresh information awaited him. The lane was still deserted, and the same calm soft light shone through the window. D'Artagnan then thought of that cottage, silent and obscure, which had no doubt seen all, and could tell its tale. The gate of the enclosure was shut, but he leaped over the hedge, and in spite of the barking of a chained-up dog, went up to the cabin. No one answered to his first knocking. A silence of death reigned in the cabin, as in the pavilion, but as the cabin was his last resource, he knocked again. It soon appeared to him that he heard a slight noise within, a timid noise which seemed to tremble lest it should be heard. Then D'Artagnan ceased knocking, and prayed with an accent so full of anxiety and promises, terror and cajolery, that his voice was of a nature to reassure the most fearful. At length an old worm-eaten shutter was opened, or rather pushed ajar, but closed again as soon as the light from a miserable lamp which burned in the corner had shone upon the baldric, sword-belt, and pistol-pommels of D'Artagnan. Nevertheless, rapid as the movement had been, D'Artagnan had had time to get a glimpse of the head of an old man. "'In the name of heaven!' cried he. "'Listen to me. I have been waiting for someone who has not come. I am dying with anxiety. Has anything particular happened in the neighborhood? Speak!' The window was again opened slowly, and the same face appeared, only it was now still more pale than before. D'Artagnan related his story simply, with the omission of names. He told how he had a rendezvous with a young woman before that pavilion, and how, not seeing her come, he had climbed the linden tree, and by the light of the lamp had seen the disorder of the chamber. The old man listened attentively, making a sign only that it was all so, and then, when D'Artagnan had ended, he shook his head with an air that announced nothing good. "'What do you mean?' cried D'Artagnan. "'In the name of heaven, explain yourself!' "'Oh, monsieur,' said the old man, "'ask me nothing, for if I dared tell you what I have seen, "'certainly no good would befall me.' "'You have, then, seen something,' replied D'Artagnan. "'In that case, in the name of heaven,' continued he, "'throwing him a pistole, "'tell me what you have seen, "'and I will pledge you the word of a gentleman "'that not one of your words shall escape from my heart.' "'The old man read so much truth "'and so much grief in the face of the young man "'that he made him a sign to listen.' and repeated in a low voice. It was scarcely nine o'clock when I heard a noise in the street, and was wondering what it could be, when, on coming to my door, I found that somebody was endeavouring to open it. As I am very poor and am not afraid of being robbed, I went and opened the gate, and saw three men at a few paces from it. In the shadow was a carriage with two horses and some saddle-horses. These horses evidently belonged to the three men, who were dressed as cavaliers. "'Ah, my worthy gentleman!' cried I. "'What do you want?' "'You must have a ladder,' said he, who appeared to be leader of the party. "'Yes, monsieur, the one with which I gather my fruit. "'Lend it to us, and go into your house again. "'There is a crown for the annoyance we have caused you. "'Only remember this. "'If you speak a word of what you may see, or what you may hear, "'for you will look, and you will listen, I am quite sure, "'however we may threaten you, you are lost.' At these words he threw me a crown, which I picked up, and he took the ladder, 
After shutting the gate behind them, I pretended to return to the house, but I immediately went out a back door, and, stealing along in the shade of the hedge, I gained yonder clump of elder, from which I could hear and see everything. The three men brought the carriage up quietly, and took out of it a little man, stout, short, elderly, and commonly dressed in clothes of a dark colour, who ascended the ladder very carefully, looked suspiciously in at the window of the pavilion, came down as quietly as he had gone up, and whispered, "'It is she!' Immediately he who had spoken to me approached the door of the pavilion, opened it with a key he had in his hand, closed the door, and it disappeared, while at the same time the other two men ascended the ladder. The little old man remained at the coach door. The coachman took care of his horses. The lackey held the saddle-horses. All at once great cries resounded in the pavilion, and a woman came to the window and opened it, as if to throw herself out of it. But as soon as she perceived the other two men, she fell back, and they went into the chamber. Then I saw no more, but I heard the noise of breaking furniture. The woman screamed and cried for help, but her cries were soon stifled. Two of the men appeared, bearing the woman in their arms, and carried her to the carriage, into which the little old man got after her. The leader closed the window, came out an instant after by the door, and satisfied himself that the woman was in the carriage. His two companions were already on horseback. He sprang into his saddle. The lackey took his place by the coachman. The carriage went off at a quick pace, escorted by the three horsemen, and all was over. From that moment I have neither seen nor heard anything." D'Artagnan, entirely overcome by this terrible story, remained motionless and mute, while all the demons of anger and jealousy were howling in his heart. "'But my good gentleman,' resumed the old man, upon whom this mute despair certainly produced a greater effect than cries and tears would have done, "'do not take on so. They did not kill her, and that's a comfort.' "'Can you guess,' said D'Artagnan, "'who was the man who headed this infernal expedition?' "'I don't know him.' "'But as you spoke to him, you must have seen him?' "'Oh, it's a description you want. "'Exactly so. "'A tall, dark man with black moustaches, dark eyes, and the air of a gentleman. "'That's the man!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Again he! Forever he! He is my demon, apparently. "'And the other? "'Which? The short one. "'Oh, he was not a gentleman. I'll answer for it. "'Besides, he did not wear a sword, and the others treated him with small consideration.' "'Some lackey,' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Poor woman! Poor woman! What have they done with you?' "'You have promised to be secret, my good monsieur,' said the old man. "'And I renew my promise. Be easy. I am a gentleman. A gentleman has but his word, and I have given you mine.' With a heavy heart, D'Artagnan again bent his way toward the fairy. Sometimes he hoped it could not be Madame Bonacieux, and that he should find her next day at the Louvre. Sometimes he feared she had had an intrigue with another, who, in a jealous fit, had surprised her and carried her off. His mind was torn by doubt, grief, and despair. "'Oh, if I had my three friends here,' cried he, "'I should have, at least, some hopes of finding her. But who knows what has become of them?' It was past midnight. The next thing was to find Planchet. D'Artagnan went successively into all the cabarets in which there was a light, but could not find Planchet in any of them. At the sixth he began to reflect that the search was rather dubious. D'Artagnan had appointed six o'clock in the morning for his lackey, and wherever he might be, he was right. Besides, it came into the young man's mind that by remaining in the environs of the spot on which this sad event had passed, he would, perhaps, have some light thrown upon the mysterious affair. At the sixth cabaret, then, as we said, D'Artagnan stopped asked for a bottle of wine of the best quality, and placing himself in the darkest corner of the room, determined thus to wait till daylight. But this time again his hopes were disappointed, and, although he listened with all his ears, he heard nothing amid the oaths, coarse jokes, and abuse which passed between the laborers, servants, and carters who comprised the honorable society of which he had formed a part, which could put him upon the least track of her who had been stolen from him. He was compelled, then, after having swallowed the contents of his bottle, to pass the time as well as to evade suspicion, to fall into the easiest position in his corner, and to sleep, whether well or ill. D'Artagnan, be it remembered, was only twenty years old, and at that age sleep has its imprescriptible rights, which it imperiously insists upon, even with the saddest hearts. Toward six o'clock 
D'Artagnan awoke with that uncomfortable feeling which generally accompanies the break of day after a bad night. He was not long in making his toilette. He examined himself to see if advantage had been taken of his sleep, and, having found his diamond ring on his finger, his purse in his pocket, and his pistols in his belt, he rose, paid for his bottle, and went out to try if he could have any better luck in his search after his lackey than he had had the night before. The first thing he perceived, through the damp grey mist, was honest Planchet, who, with the two horses in hand, awaited him at the door of a little blind cabaret, before which D'Artagnan had passed without even a suspicion of its existence. End of chapter 24box recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by chris the girl the three musketeers by alexandre dumas chapter 25 porthos instead of returning directly home d'artagnan alighted at the door of monsieur de treville and ran quickly up the stairs this time he had decided to relate all that had passed. M. de Treville would doubtless give him good advice as to the whole affair. Besides, as M. de Treville saw the Queen almost daily, he might be able to draw from Her Majesty some intelligence of the poor young woman, whom they were doubtless making pay very dearly for her devotedness to her mistress. M. de Treville listened to the young man's account with a seriousness which proved that he saw something else in this adventure besides a love affair. When D'Artagnan had finished, he said, all this savors of his eminence a league off. But what is to be done? said D'Artagnan. Nothing, absolutely nothing at present, but quitting Paris, as I told you, as soon as possible. I will see the Queen. I will relate to her the details of the disappearance of this poor woman, of which she is no doubt ignorant. These details will guide her on her part, and on your return I shall perhaps have some good news to tell you. Rely on me. D'Artagnan knew that, although a Gascon, M. de Treville was not in the habit of making promises, and that when by chance he did promise, he more than kept his word. He bowed to him then, full of gratitude for the past and for the future, and the worthy captain, who on his side felt a lively interest in this young man, so brave and so resolute, pressed his hand kindly, wishing him a pleasant journey. Determined to put the advice of M. de Treville in practice instantly, D'Artagnan directed his course toward the Rue des Fossoyeurs, in order to superintend the packing of his valise. On approaching the house, he perceived M. Bonacieux in mourning costume, standing at his threshold. All that the prudent Planchet had said to him the preceding evening about the sinister character of the old man recurred to the mind of D'Artagnan, who looked at him with more attention than he had done before. In fact, in addition to that yellow, sickly paleness, which indicates the insinuation of the bile in the blood, and which might, besides, be accidental. D'Artagnan remarked something perfidiously significant in the play of the wrinkled features of his countenance. A rogue does not laugh in the same way that an honest man does. A hypocrite does not shed the tears of a man of good faith. All falsehood is a mask, and however well made the mask may be, with a little attention we may always succeed in distinguishing it from the true face. It appeared then to D'Artagnan that M. Bonacieux wore a mask, and likewise that that mask was most disagreeable to look upon. In consequence of this feeling of repugnance, he was about to pass without speaking to him, but, as he had done the day before, M. Bonacieux accosted him. "'Well, young man,' said he, "'we appear to pass rather gay nights. Seven o'clock in the morning! Pest!' You seem to reverse ordinary customs, and come home at the hour when other people are going out. "'No one can reproach you for anything of the kind, Monsieur Bonacieux,' said the young man. "'You are a model for regular people. It is true that when a man possesses a young and pretty wife he has no need to seek happiness elsewhere. Happiness comes to meet him, does it not, Monsieur Bonacieux?' Bonacieux became as pale as death, and grinned a ghastly smile. Ah, ah, said Bonacieux, you are a jocular companion. But where the devil were you gladding last night, my young master? It does not appear to be very clean in the crossroads. D'Artagnan glanced down at his boots, 
all covered with mud. But that same glance fell upon the shoes and stockings of the mercer, and it might have been said that they had been dipped in the same mud heap. Both were stained with splashes of mud of the same appearance. Then a sudden idea crossed the mind of D'Artagnan. That little stout man, short and elderly, that sort of lackey, dressed in dark clothes, treated without ceremony by the men wearing swords who composed the escort, was Bonacieux himself. The husband had presided at the abduction of his wife. A terrible inclination seized D'Artagnan to grasp the mercer by the throat and strangle him. But, as we have said, he was a very prudent youth, and he restrained himself. However, the revolution which appeared upon his countenance was so visible that Bonacieux was terrified at it, and he endeavored to draw back a step or two. But as he was standing before the half of the door which was shut, the obstacle compelled him to keep his place. "'Ah, but you were joking, my worthy man,' said D'Artagnan. "'It appears to me that if my boots need a sponge, your stockings and shoes stand in equal need of a brush. May you not have been philandering a little also, Monsieur Bonacieux? Oh, the devil! That's unpardonable in a man of your age, and who, besides, has such a pretty wife as yours? Oh, Lord, no, said Bonacieux, but yesterday I went to saint mand to make some inquiries after a servant, as I cannot possibly do without one, and the roads were so bad that I brought back all this mud which I have not yet had time to remove. The place named by Bonacieux as that which had been the object of his journey was a fresh proof in support of the suspicions D'Artagnan had conceived. Bonacieux had named Mand, because Mand was in an exactly opposite direction from Saint-Cloud. This probability afforded him his first consolation. If Bonacieux knew where his wife was, one might, by extreme means, force the mercer to open his teeth and let his secret escape. The question, then, was how to change this probability into a certainty. Pardon, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, if I don't stand upon ceremony, said D'Artagnan, but nothing makes one so thirsty as want of sleep. I am parched with thirst. Allow me to take a glass of water in your apartment. You know that is never refused among neighbors. Without waiting for the permission of his host, D'Artagnan went quickly into the house and cast a rapid glance at the bed. It had not been used. Bonacieux had not been abed. He had only been back an hour or two. He had accompanied his wife to the place of her confinement, or else at least to the first relay. "'Thanks, Monsieur Bonacieux,' said D'Artagnan, emptying his glass. "'That is all I wanted of you. I will now go up into my apartment. I will make Planchet brush my boots, and when he is done I will, if you like, send him to you to brush your shoes.' He left the mercer quite astonished at his singular farewell and asking himself if he had not been a little inconsiderate. At the top of the stairs, he found Planchet in a great fright. "'Ah, monsieur!' cried Planchet, as soon as he perceived his master. "'Here is more trouble. I thought you would never come in.' "'What's the matter now, Planchet?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'Oh, I give you a hundred, I give you a thousand times to guess, monsieur, the visit I received in your absence.' "'When?' "'About half an hour ago, when you were at Monsieur de Treville's. "'Who has been here? Come, speak.' Monsieur de Cavois. Monsieur de Cavois? In person. The captain of the cardinal's guards? Himself. Did he come to arrest me? I have no doubt that he did, monsieur, for all his wheedling manner. Was he so sweet, then? Indeed, he was all honey, monsieur. Indeed. He came, he said, on the part of his eminence, who wished you well, and to beg you to follow him to the Palais Royal. What did you answer him? that the thing was impossible, seeing that you were not at home, as he could see. Well, what did he say then? That you must not fail to call upon him in the course of the day. And then he added in a low voice, Tell your master that his eminence is very well disposed toward him, and that his fortune perhaps depends upon this interview. The snare is rather maladroit for the cardinal, replied the young man, smiling. Oh, I saw the snare, and I answered you would be quite in despair on your return. Where has he gone? asked M. de Cavois. To Troyes, in Champagne, I answered. And when did he set out? Yesterday evening. Planchet, my friend, interrupted D'Artagnan, you are really a precious fellow. You will understand, monsieur, I thought there would be still time, if you wish, to see M. de Cavois to contradict me by saying you were not yet gone. The falsehood would then lie at my door, and as I am not a gentleman, I may be allowed to lie. 
Be of good heart, Planchet. You shall preserve your reputation as a voracious man. In a quarter of an hour we set off. That's the advice I was about to give Monsieur. And where are we going, may I ask, without being too curious? Pardieu! In the opposite direction to that which you said I was gone. Besides, are you not as anxious to learn news of Grimaud, Mousqueton, and Brazin as I am to know what has become of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis? Yes, monsieur, said Planchet, and I will go as soon as you please. Indeed, I think provincial air will suit us much better just now than the air of Paris. So then... So then pack up our luggage, Planchet, and let us be off. On my part, I will go out with my hands in my pockets, that nothing may be suspected. You may join me at the Hotel de Galde. By the way, Planchet, I think you are right with respect to our host, and that he is decidedly a frightfully low wretch. Ah, monsieur, you may take my word when I tell you anything. I am a physiognomist, I assure you. D'Artagnan went out first, as had been agreed upon. Then, in order that he might have nothing to reproach himself with, he directed his steps, for the last time, toward the residences of his three friends. No news had been received of them. Only a small letter, all perfumed, and of an elegant writing in small characters, had come for Aramis. D'Artagnan took charge of it. Ten minutes afterward, Planchet joined him at the stables of the Hôtel de Galve. D'Artagnan, in order that there might be no time lost, had saddled his horse himself. "'That's well,' said he to Planchet, when the latter added the portmanteau to the equipment. "'Now saddle the other three horses.' "'Do you think, then, monsieur, that we shall travel faster with two horses apiece?' said Planchet, with his shrewd air. "'No, monsieur Jester,' replied D'Artagnan. "'But with our four horses we may bring back our three friends, if we should have the good fortune to find them living.' "'Which is a great chance,' replied Planchet. "'But we must not despair of the mercy of God.' "'Amen,' said D'Artagnan, getting into his saddle. As they went from the Hôtel de Garde, they separated, leaving the street at opposite ends one having to quit Paris by the Barrière de la Villette, and the other by the Barrière Montmartre, to meet again beyond Saint-Denis, a strategic manoeuvre which, having been executed with equal punctuality, was crowned with the most fortunate results. D'Artagnan and Planchet entered Pierrefitte together. Planchet was more courageous, it must be admitted, by day than by night. His natural prudence, however, never forsook him for a single instant. He had forgotten not one of the incidents of the first journey, and he looked upon everybody he met on the road as an enemy. It followed that his hat was forever in his hand, which procured him some severe reprimands from D'Artagnan, who feared that his excess of politeness would lead people to think he was the lackey of a man of no consequence. Nevertheless, whether the passengers were really touched by the urbanity of Planchet, or whether this time nobody was posted on the young man's road, our two travellers arrived at Chantilly without any accident and alighted at the tavern of Great Saint-Martin, the same at which they had stopped on their first journey. The host, on seeing a young man followed by a lackey with two extra horses, advanced respectfully to the door. Now, as they had already travelled eleven leagues, D'Artagnan thought it time to stop, whether Porthos were or were not in the inn. Perhaps it would not be prudent to ask at once what had become of the Marsquetier. The result of these reflections was that D'Artagnan, without asking information of any kind, alighted, commended the horses to the care of his lackey, entered a small room destined to receive those who wished to be alone, and desired the host to bring him a bottle of his best wine, and as good a breakfast as possible, a desire which further corroborated the high opinion the innkeeper had formed of the traveller at first sight. D'Artagnan was therefore served with miraculous celerity. The regiment of the guards was recruited among the first gentlemen of the kingdom, and D'Artagnan, followed by a lackey, and travelling with four magnificent horses, despite the simplicity of his uniform, could not fail to make a sensation. The host desired himself to serve him, which D'Artagnan, perceiving, ordered two glasses to be brought, and commenced the following conversation. "'My faith, my good host,' said D'Artagnan, filling the two glasses, "'I asked for a bottle of your best wine, and if you have deceived me, you will be punished in what you have sinned. For seeing that I hate drinking by myself, you shall drink with me. Take your glass, then, and let us drink.' But what shall we drink to, so as to avoid wounding any susceptibility? Let us drink to the prosperity of your establishment. Your lordship does me much honour, said the host, and I thank you sincerely for your kind wish. But don't mistake, said D'Artagnan, there is more selfishness in my toast than perhaps you may think, for it is only in prosperous establishments that one is well received. In hotels that do not flourish, everything is in confusion, and the traveller is a victim to the embarrassments of his host. Now, I travel a great deal, 
particularly on this road, and I wish to see all innkeepers making a fortune. It seems to me, said the host, that this is not the first time I have had the honour of seeing monsieur. Bah, I have passed perhaps ten times through Chantilly, and out of the ten times I have stopped three or four times at your house at least. Why, I was here only ten or twelve days ago. I was conducting some friends, musketeers, one of whom, by the by, had a dispute with a stranger, a man who sought a quarrel with him, for I don't know what. Exactly so, said the host. I remember it perfectly. Is it not Monsieur Porthos that your lordship means? Yes, that is my companion's name. My God, my dear host, tell me if anything has happened to him. Your lordship must have observed that he could not continue his journey. Why, to be sure, he promised to rejoin us, and we have seen nothing of him. He has done us the honour to remain here. What, he had done you the honour to remain here? Yes, monsieur, in this house. And we are even a little uneasy. On what account? Of certain expenses he has contracted. Well, but whatever expenses he may have incurred, I'm sure he is in a condition to pay them. Ah, monsieur, you infuse genuine balm into my blood. We have made considerable advances, and this very morning the surgeon declared that if Monsieur Porthos did not pay him, he should look to me as it was I who had sent for him. Porthos is wounded, then? I cannot tell you, monsieur. What? You cannot tell me. Surely you ought to be able to tell me better than any other person. Yes, but in our situation we must not say all we know, particularly as we have been warned that our ears should answer for our tongues. Well, can I see Porthos? Certainly, monsieur. Take the stairs on your right, go up the first flight, and knock at number one. Only warn him that it is you. Why should I do that? Because, monsieur, some mischief might happen to you. Of what kind, in the name of wonder? Monsieur Porthos may imagine you belong to the house, and in a fit of passion may run his sword through you, or blow out your brains. What have you done to him, then? We have asked him for money. The devil! Ah, oh, I can understand that. It is a demand that Porthos takes very ill when he is not in funds, but I know he must be so at present. We thought so too, monsieur, as our house is carried on very regularly, and we make out our bills every week. At the end of eight days we presented our account, but it appeared we had chosen an unlucky moment, for at the first word on the subject he sent us all to the devils. It is true, he had been playing the day before. Playing the day before? And with whom? Lord, who can say, monsieur, with some gentleman who is travelling this way, to whom he proposed a game of lansquenette? That's it, then. And the foolish fellow lost all he had? Even to his horse, monsieur. For when the gentleman was about to set out, he perceived that his lackey was saddling monsieur Porthos's horse, as well as his master's. When we observed this to him, he told us all to trouble ourselves about our own business, as this horse belonged to him. We also informed Monsieur Porthos of what was going on, but he told us we were scoundrels to doubt a gentleman's word, and that as he had said the horse was his, it must be so. That's Porthos all over, murmured D'Artagnan. Then, continued the host, I replied that as from the moment we seemed not likely to come to a good understanding with respect to payment, I hoped that he would have at least the kindness to grant the favor of his custom to my brother, host of the Golden Eagle. But M. Porthos replied that my house, being the best, he should remain where he was. This reply was too flattering to allow me to insist on his departure. I confined myself then to begging him to give up his chamber, which is the handsomest in the hotel, and to be satisfied with a pretty little room on the third floor. But to this M. Porthos replied that as he every moment expected his mistress, who was one of the greatest ladies in the court, I might easily comprehend that the chamber he did me the honour to occupy in my house was itself very mean for the visit of such a personage. Nevertheless, while acknowledging the truth of what he said, I thought proper to insist, though without even giving himself the trouble to enter into any discussion with me, he took one of his pistols, laid it on his table, day and night, and said that at the first word that should be spoken to him about removing either within the house or out of it, he would blow out the brains of the person who should be so imprudent as to meddle with a matter which only concerned himself. Since that time, monsieur, nobody entered his chamber but his servant. What? Mousqueton is here, then? Oh, yes, monsieur. Five days after your departure he came back, and in a very bad condition, too. It appears that he had met with disagreeableness, likewise, on his journey. Unfortunately, he is more nimble than his master, so that, for the sake of his master, he puts us all under his feet. And as he thinks we might refuse what he asked for, 
he takes all he wants without asking at all the fact is said d'artagnan i have always observed a great degree of intelligence and devotedness in mousqueton that is possible monsieur but suppose i should happen to be brought in contact even four times a year with such intelligence and devotedness why i should be a ruined man no for porthos will pay you huh, said the host in a doubtful tone the favorite of a great lady will not be allowed to be inconvenienced for such a paltry sum as he owes you if i durst say what i believe on that head what you believe i ought rather to say what i know what you know and even that i am sure of and of what are you so sure i would say that i know this great lady you yes i and how do you know her oh monsieur if i could believe i might trust in your discretion speak by the word of a gentleman you shall have no cause to repent of your confidence well monsieur you understand that uneasiness makes us do many things what have you done oh nothing which was not right in the character of a creditor well monsieur porthos gave us a note for his duchess ordering us to put it in the post this was before his servant came as he could not leave his chamber it was necessary to charge us with this commission and then instead of putting the letter in the post which is never safe i took advantage of the journey of one of my lads to paris and ordered him to convey the letter to this duchess himself this was fulfilling the intentions of monsieur porthos who had desired us to be so careful of this letter was it not nearly so well monsieur do you know who this great lady is no i have heard porthos speak of her that's all do you know who this pretended duchess is i repeat to you i don't know her why she is the old wife of a procurator of the chatelet monsieur named madame coquenard who although she is at least fifty still gives herself jealous airs it struck me as very odd that a princess should live in the rue aux ours but how do you know all this because she flew into a great passion on receiving the letter saying that monsieur porthos was a weathercock and that she was sure it was for some woman he had received this wound has he been wounded then oh good lord what have i said you said that porthos had received a sword cut yes but he has forbidden me so strictly to say so and why so zounds monsieur because he had boasted that he would perforate the stranger with whom you left him in dispute whereas the stranger on the contrary in spite of all his rodomantades quickly threw him on his back as monsieur porthos is a very boastful man he insists that nobody shall know he has received this wound except the duchess whom he endeavoured to interest by an account of his adventures it is a wound that confines him to his bed ah and a master-stroke too i assure you your friend's soul must stick tight to his body were you there then monsieur i followed them from curiosity so that i saw the combat without the combatants seeing me and what took place oh the affair was not long i assure you they placed themselves on guard the stranger made a feint and a lunge and that so rapidly that when monsieur porthos came to the parade he had already three inches of steel in his breast he immediately fell backward the stranger placed the point of his sword at his throat and monsieur porthos finding himself at the mercy of his adversary acknowledged himself conquered upon which the stranger asked his name and learning that it was porthos and not d'artagnan he assisted him to rise brought him back to the hotel mounted his horse and disappeared so it was with monsieur d'artagnan this stranger meant to quarrel it appears so and do you know what has become of him no i never saw him until that moment and have not seen him since very well i know all that i wish to know porthos's chamber is you say on the first story number one yes monsieur the handsomest in the inn a chamber that i could have let ten times over bah be satisfied said d'artagnan laughing porthos will pay you with the money of the duchess coquenard oh monsieur procurator's wife or duchess if she will but loosen her purse-strings it will be all the same but she positively answered that she was tired of the exigencies and infidelities of monsieur porthos and that she would not send him a denier and did you convey this answer to your guest we took good care not to do that he would have found in what fashion he had executed his commission so that he still expects his money oh lord yes monsieur yesterday he wrote again 
that it was his servant who this time put the letter in the post. Do you say the procurator's wife is old and ugly? Fifty at least, monsieur, and not at all handsome, according to Pathot's account. In that case, you may be quite at ease. She will soon be softened. Besides, Porthos cannot owe you much. How not much? Twenty good pistoles already, without reckoning the doctor. He denies himself nothing. It may easily be seen he has been accustomed to live well. Never mind. If his mistress abandons him, he will find friends. I will answer for it. So, my dear host, be not uneasy, and continue to take all the care of him that his situation requires. Monsieur has promised me not to open his mouth about the procurator's wife, and not to say a word of the wound. That's agreed. You have my word. Oh, he would kill me. Don't be afraid. He is not so much of a devil as he appears. Saying these words, D'Artagnan went upstairs, leaving his host a little better satisfied with respect to two things in life which he appeared to be very much interested in, his debt and his life. At the top of the stairs, upon the most conspicuous door of the corridor, was traced in black ink a gigantic number one. D'Artagnan knocked, and upon the bidding to come in, which came from inside, he entered the chamber. Porthos was in bed, and was playing a game at Lasquenet with Mousqueton, to keep his hand in, while a spit loaded with partridges was turning before the fire, and on each side of a large chimney-piece, over two chafing-dishes, were boiling two stew-pans, from which exhaled a double odor of rabbit and fish stews, rejoicing to the smell. In addition to this, he perceived that the top of a wardrobe and the marble of a commode were covered with empty bottles. At the sight of his friend, Porthos uttered a loud cry of joy, and Mousqueton, rising respectfully, yielded his place to him, and went to give an eye to the two stewpans, of which he appeared to have the particular inspection. "'Ah, oh, par Dieu, is that you?' said Porthos to D'Artagnan. "'You are right welcome. Excuse my not coming to meet you, but,' added he, looking at D'Artagnan with a certain degree of uneasiness, "'you know what has happened to me?' "'No.' "'Has the host told you nothing, then?' "'I asked after you and came up as soon as I could.' Porthos seemed to breathe more freely. "'And what has happened to you, my dear Porthos?' continued D'Artagnan. "'Why, on making a thrust at my adversary, whom I had already hit three times, and whom I meant to finish with the fourth, I put my foot on a stone, slipped and strained my knee. "'Truly? Honor! Luckily for the rascal, for I should have left him dead on the spot, I assure you.' And what has become of him? Oh, I don't know. He had enough and set off without waiting for the rest. But you, my dear D'Artagnan, what has happened to you? So that this strain of the knee, continued D'Artagnan, my dear Porthos, keeps you in bed? My God, that's all. I shall be about again in a few days. Why did you not have yourself conveyed to Paris? You must be cruelly bored here. That was my intention, but, my dear friend, I have one thing to confess to you. What's that? It is that as I was cruelly bored, as you say, and as I had the seventy-five pistoles in my pocket, which you had distributed to me, in order to amuse myself, I invited a gentleman who was travelling this way to walk up, and proposed a cast of dice. He accepted my challenge, and my faith, my seventy-five pistoles passed from my pocket to his, without reckoning my horse, which he won into the bargain. But you, my dear D'Artagnan? What can you expect, my dear Porthos? A man is not privileged in all ways, said D'Artagnan. You know the proverb, unlucky at play, lucky in love. You were too fortunate in your love for play not to take its revenge. What consequence can the reverses of fortune be to you? Have you not, happy rogue that you are, have you not your duchess, who cannot fail to come to your aid? Well, you see, my dear D'Artagnan, with what ill luck I play, replied Porthos, with the most careless air in the world. I wrote to her to send me fifty louis or so of which I stood absolutely in need on account of my accident. Well? Well, she must be at her country seat, for she has not answered me. Truly? No. So I yesterday addressed another epistle to her, still more pressing than the first. But you are here, my dear fellow. Let us speak of you. I confess I began to be very uneasy on your account. But your host behaves very well toward you, as it appears, my dear Porthos said D'Artagnan, directing the sick man's attentions to the full stewpans and the empty bottles. So, so, replied Porthos. Only three or four days ago the impertinent jackanapes gave me his bill, and I was forced to turn both him and his bill out of the door, so that I am here, 
something in the fashion of a conqueror, holding my position, as it were, my conquest. So you see, being in constant fear of being forced from that position, I am armed to the teeth. And yet, said D'Artagnan, laughing, it appears to me that from time to time you must make sortie. And he again pointed to the bottles and the stewpans. Not I, unfortunately, said Porthos. This miserable strain confines me to my bed. But Mousqueton forages, and brings in provisions. Friend Mousqueton, you see that we have a reinforcement, and we must have an increase of supplies. Mousqueton, said D'Artagnan, you must render me a service. What, monsieur? You must give your recipe to Planchet. I may be besieged in my turn, and I shall not be sorry for him to be able to let me enjoy the same advantages with which you gratify your master. Lord, monsieur, there is nothing more easy, said Mousqueton, with a modest air. One only needs to be sharp, that's all. I was brought up in the country, and my father, in his leisure time, was something of a poacher. And what did he do the rest of the time? Monsieur, he carried on a trade which I have always thought satisfactory. Which? As it was a time of war between the Catholics and the Huguenots, and as he saw the Catholics exterminate the Huguenots, and the Huguenots exterminate the Catholics, all in the name of religion, he adopted a mixed belief which permitted him to be sometimes Catholic, sometimes a Huguenot. Now he was accustomed to walk with his fowling piece on his shoulder, behind the hedges which border the roads, and when he saw a Catholic coming alone, the Protestant religion immediately prevailed in his mind. He lowered his gun in the direction of the traveller. Then, when he was within ten paces of him, he commenced a conversation which almost always ended by the traveller's abandoning his purse to save his life. It goes without saying that when he saw Huguenot coming, he felt himself filled with such ardent Catholic zeal that he could not understand how, a quarter of an hour before, he had been able to have any doubts upon the superiority of our holy religion. For my part, monsieur, I am Catholic, my father, faithful to his principles, having made my elder brother a Huguenot. And what was the end of this worthy man? asked D'Artagnan. Oh, of the most unfortunate kind, monsieur. One day he was surprised in the lonely road between a Huguenot and a Catholic, with both of whom he had before had business, and who both knew him again. So they united against him and hanged him on a tree. Then they came and boasted of their fine exploit in the cabaret of the next village, where my brother and I were drinking. And what did you do? said D'Artagnan. We let them tell their story out, replied Mousqueton. Then, as in leaving the cabaret, they took different directions. My brother went and hid himself on the road of the Catholic, and I on that of the Huguenot. Two hours after, all was over. We had done the business of both, admiring the foresight of our poor father, who had taken the precaution to bring each of us up in a different religion. Well, I must allow, as you say, your father was a very intelligent fellow. And you say in his leisure moments the worthy man was a poacher? Yes, monsieur and it was he who taught me to lay a snare and ground a line. The consequence is that when I saw our laborers, which did not at all suit two such delicate stomachs as ours, I had recourse to a little of my old trade. While walking near the wood of Monsieur le Prince, I laid a few snare in the runs, and while reclining on the banks of His Highness's pieces of water, I slipped a few lines into his fish-ponds, so that now, thanks be to God, we do not want, as Monsieur can testify, for partridges, rabbits, carp, or eels all light, wholesome food, suitable for the sick. But the wine, said D'Artagnan, who furnishes the wine? Your host? That is to say, yes and no. How yes and no? He furnishes it, it is true, but he does not know that he has that honor. Explain yourself, Mousqueton. Your conversation is full of instructive things. That is it, monsieur. It has so chanced that I met with a Spaniard in my peregrinations who had seen many countries, and among them the new world. What connection can the new world have with the bottles which are on the commode in the wardrobe? Patience, monsieur. Everything will come in its turn. This Spaniard had in his service a lackey who had accompanied him in his voyage to Mexico. This lackey was my compatriot, and we became the more intimate from there being many resemblances of character between us. We loved sporting of all kinds better than anything so that he related to me how in the plains of the Pampas the natives hunt the tiger and the wild bull with simple running nooses which they throw to a distance of twenty or thirty paces, the end of a cord with such nicety. But in face of the proof I was obliged to acknowledge the truth of the recital. My friend placed a bottle at the distance of thirty paces, and at each cast he caught the neck of the bottle in his running noose. 
I practice this exercise, and as nature has endowed me with some faculties, at this day I can throw the lasso with any man in the world. Well, do you understand, monsieur? Our host has a well-furnished cellar, the key of which never leaves him. Only the cellar has a ventilating hole. Now, through this ventilating hole I throw my lasso, and as I know now in which part of the cellar is the best wine, that's my point for sport. You see, monsieur, what the new world has to do with the bottles which are on the commode and the wardrobe. Now, will you taste our wine, and without prejudice say what you think of it? Thank you, my friend, thank you. Unfortunately, I have just breakfasted. Well, said Porthos, arrange the table, Mousqueton, and while we breakfast, D'Artagnan will relate to us what has happened to him during the ten days since he left us. Willingly, said D'Artagnan. While Porthos and Mousqueton were breakfasting, with the appetites of convalescence and with that brotherly cordiality which unites men in misfortune, D'Artagnan related how Aramis, being wounded, was obliged to stop at Crèvecoeur, how he had left Athos fighting at Amiens with four men who accused him of being a coiner, and how he, D'Artagnan, had been forced to run the Comte de Ward through the body in order to reach England. But there the confidence of D'Artagnan stopped. He only added that on his return from Great Britain he had brought back four magnificent horses, one for himself and one for each of his companions. Then he informed Porthos that the one intended for him was already installed in the stable of the tavern. At this moment Planchet entered, to inform his master that the horses were sufficiently refreshed that it would be possible to sleep at Clermont. As D'Artagnan was tolerably reassured with regard to Porthos, and as he was anxious to obtain news of his two other friends, he held out his hand to the wounded man and told him he was about to resume his route in order to continue his researches. For the rest, as he reckoned upon returning by the same route in seven or eight days, if Porthos were still at the great Saint-Martin, he would call for him on his way. Porthos replied that in all probability his sprain would not permit him to depart yet a while. Besides, it was necessary he should stay at Chantilly to wait for the answer from his duchess. D'Artagnan wished that answer might be prompt and favorable, and having again recommended Porthos to the care of Mousqueton, and paid his bill to the host, he resumed his route with Planchet, already relieved of one of his led horses. End of chapter 25 Of The Three Musketeers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Chapter Twenty Six, Aramis and His Thesis. D'Artagnan had said nothing to Porthos of his wound or of his procurator's wife. Our Bernet was a prudent lad, however young he might be. Consequently, he had appeared to believe all that the vainglorious musketeer had told him, convinced that no friendship will hold out against a surprised secret. Besides, we feel always a sort of mental superiority over those whose lives we know better than they suppose. In his projects of intrigue for the future, and determined as he was to make his three friends the instruments of his fortune, D'Artagnan was not sorry at getting into his grasp beforehand the invisible strings by which he reckoned upon moving them. And yet, as he journeyed along, a profound sadness weighed upon his heart. He thought of that young and pretty Madame Bonacieux, who was to have paid him the price of his devotedness. But let us hasten to say that this sadness possessed the young man less from the regret of the happiness he had missed, than from the fear he entertained that some serious misfortune had befallen the poor woman. For himself, he had no doubt she was a victim of the cardinal's vengeance, and, as was well known, the vengeance of his eminence was terrible. How he had found grace in the eyes of the minister he did not know, but without doubt M. de Cavois would have revealed this to him if the captain of the guards had found him at home. Nothing makes time pass more quickly or more shortens a journey than a thought which absorbs in itself all the faculties of the organization of him who thinks. External existence then resembles a sleep of which this thought is the dream. By its influence time has no longer measure, space has no longer distance. We depart from one place and arrive at another, that is all. Of the interval past, nothing remains in the memory but a vague mist in which a thousand confused images of trees, mountains, and landscapes are lost. It was as a prey to this hallucination that D'Artagnan travelled, at whatever pace his horse pleased, the six or eight leagues that separated Chantilly from Crèvecoeur, 
without his being able to remember on his arrival in the village any of the things he had passed or met with on the road. There only his memory returned to him. He shook his head, perceived the cabaret at which he had left Aramis, and putting his horse to the trot, he shortly pulled up at the door. This time it was not a host but a hostess who received him. D'Artagnan was a physiognomist. His eye took in at a glance the plump, cheerful countenance of the mistress of the place, and he at once perceived there was no occasion for dissembling with her, or of fearing anything from one blessed with such a joyous physiognomy. "'My good dame,' asked D'Artagnan, "'can you tell me what has become of one of my friends, whom we were obliged to leave here about a dozen days ago?' "'A handsome young man, three or four and twenty years old, mild, amiable, and well-made?' "'That is he, wounded in the shoulder.' just so well monsieur he is still here ah pardieu my dear dame said d'artagnan springing from his horse and throwing the bridle to planchet you restore me to life where is this dear aramis let me embrace him i am in a hurry to see him again pardon monsieur but i doubt whether he can see you at this moment why so has he a lady with him jesus what do you mean by that poor lad no monsieur he has not a lady with him with whom is he then with the curate of Montdidier and the superior of the Jesuits of Amiens. "'Good heavens!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Is the poor fellow worse, then?' "'No, monsieur. Quite the contrary. But after his illness, Grace touched him, and he determined to take orders.' "'That's it,' said D'Artagnan. "'I had forgotten that he was only a musketeer for a time. "'Monsieur still insists upon seeing him?' "'More than ever.' "'Well, monsieur has only to take the right-hand staircase in the courtyard "'and knock at number five on the second floor.' "'D'Artagnan walked quickly in the direction indicated "'and found one of those exterior staircases "'that are still to be seen in the yards of our old-fashioned taverns. "'But there was no getting at the place of sojourn of the future abbé. "'The defiles of the chamber of Aramis were as well guarded as the gardens of Armida. Bazin was stationed in the corridor, and barred his passage with the more intrepidity that, after many years of trial, Bazin found himself near a result of which he had ever been ambitious. In fact, the dream of poor Bazin had always been to serve a churchman, and he awaited with impatience the moment, always in the future, when Aramis would throw aside the uniform and assume the cassock. The daily renewed promise of the young man, that the moment would not long be delayed, had alone kept him in the service of a musketeer a service in which, he said, his soul was in constant jeopardy. Bazin was then at the height of joy. In all probability, this time his master would not retract. The union of physical pain with moral uneasiness had produced the effect so long desired. Aramis, suffering at once in body and mind, had at length fixed his eyes and his thoughts upon religion, and he had considered as a warning from heaven the double accident which had happened to him that is to say, the sudden disappearance of his mistress, and the wound in his shoulder. It may be easily understood that in the present disposition of his master nothing could be more disagreeable to Bazin than the arrival of D'Artagnan, which might cast his master back again into that vortex of mundane affairs which had so long carried him away. He resolved, then, to defend the door bravely, and as, betrayed by the mistress of the inn, he could not say that Aramis was absent, he endeavoured to prove to the newcomer that it would be the height of indiscretion to disturb his master in his pious conference, which had commenced with the morning, and would not, as Bazin said, terminate before night. But D'Artagnan took very little heed of the eloquent discourse of M. Bazin, and as he had no desire to support a polemic discussion with his friend's valet, he simply moved him out of the way with one hand, and with the other turned the handle of the door of number five. The door opened, and D'Artagnan went into the chamber. Aramis, in a black gown, his head enveloped in a sort of round flat cap, not much unlike a calotte, was seated before an oblong table, covered with rolls of paper and enormous volumes in folio. At his right hand was placed the superior of the Jesuits, and on his left the curate of Montdidier. The curtains were half-drawn, and only admitted the mysterious light calculated for beatific reveries. All the mundane objects that generally strike the eye on entering the room of a young man, particularly when that young man is a musketeer, had disappeared as if by enchantment, and for fear, no doubt, that the sight of them might bring his master back to ideas of this world, Bazin had laid his hands upon sword, pistols, plumed hat, and embroideries and laces of all kinds and sorts. In their stead, D'Artagnan thought he perceived in an obscure corner a discipline court, 
suspended from a nail in the wall. At the noise made by D'Artagnan in entering, Aramis lifted up his head and beheld his friend. But to the great astonishment of the young man, the sight of him did not produce much effect upon the musketeer, so completely was his mind detached from the things of this world. "'Good day, dear D'Artagnan,' said Aramis. "'Believe me, I am glad to see you.' "'So am I delighted to see you,' said D'Artagnan, "'although I am not yet sure that it is Aramis I am speaking to.' "'To himself, my friend, to himself. But what makes you doubt it?' "'I was afraid I had made a mistake in the chamber, and that I had found my way into the apartment of some churchman. Then another error seized me on seeing you in company with these gentlemen. I was afraid you were dangerously ill.' The two men in black, who guessed D'Artagnan's meaning, darted at him a glance which might have been thought threatening, but D'Artagnan took no heed of it. "'I disturb you, perhaps, my dear Aramis,' continued D'Artagnan, "'for by what I see I am led to believe that you are confessing to these gentlemen.' Aramis coloured imperceptibly. "'You disturb me? Oh, quite the contrary, dear friend, I swear. And as a proof of what I say, permit me to declare I am rejoiced to see you safe and sound.' "'Ah, he'll come around,' thought D'Artagnan. "'That's not bad.' "'This gentleman, who is my friend, has just escaped from a serious danger,' continued Aramis, with unction, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand, and addressing the two ecclesiastics. "'Praise God, monsieur,' replied they, bowing together. "'I have not failed to do so, your reverences,' replied the young man, returning their salutations. "'You arrive in good time, dear D'Artagnan,' said Aramis, "'and by taking part in our discussion may assist us with your intelligence. Monsieur the Principal of Amiens, Monsieur the Curate of Montdidier, and I are arguing certain theological questions in which we have been much interested. I shall be delighted to have your opinion.' "'The opinion of a swordsman can have very little weight,' replied D'Artagnan, who began to be uneasy at the turn things were taking, "'and you had better be satisfied, believe me, with the knowledge of these gentlemen.' The two men in black bowed in their turn. "'On the contrary,' replied Aramis, "'your opinion will be very valuable. The question is this. Monsieur the Principal thinks that my thesis ought to be dogmatic and didactic.' "'Your thesis? Are you then making a thesis?' "'Without doubt,' replied the Jesuit. "'In the examination which precedes ordination, a thesis is always a requisite.' "'Ordination!' cried D'Artagnan who could not believe what the hostess and Bazin had successively told him, and he gazed, half stupefied, upon the three persons before him. "'Now,' continued Aramis, taking the same graceful position in his easy chair that he would have assumed in bed, and complacently examining his hand, which was as white and plump as that of a woman, and which he held in the air to cause the blood to descend, "'Now, as you have heard, D'Artagnan, Monsieur the Principal is desirous that my thesis should be dogmatic.' while I, for my part, would rather it should be ideal. This is the reason why M. the Principal has proposed to me the following subject, which has not yet been treated upon, and in which I perceive there is matter for magnificent elaboration. Utraque manus in benicendo clericis inferioribus necessaria est. D'Artagnan, whose erudition we are well acquainted with, evinced no more interest on hearing this quotation than he had at that of M. de Treville in allusion to the gifts he pretended that D'Artagnan had received from the Duke of Buckingham. "'Which means,' resumed Aramis, that he might perfectly understand, "'the two hands are indispensable for priests of the inferior orders when they bestow the benediction.' "'An admirable subject!' cried the Jesuit. "'Admirable and dogmatic!' repeated the curate, who, about as strong as D'Artagnan with respect to Latin, carefully watched the Jesuit in order to keep step with him, and repeated his words like an echo. As to D'Artagnan, he remained perfectly insensible to the enthusiasm of the two men in black. "'Yes, admirable. Porzus admirabile,' continued Aramis, "'but which requires a profound study of both the scriptures and the fathers.' Now, I have confessed to these learned ecclesiastics, and that in all humility, that the duties of mounting God and the service of the king have caused me to neglect study a little. I should find myself, therefore, more at my ease, facilus natans, in a subject of my own choice, which would be to these hard theological questions what morals are to metaphysics in philosophy. D'Artagnan began to be tired, and so did the curate. "'See what an exordium!' cried the Jesuit. Exordium, repeated the curate, for the sake of saying something. Quem ad modum inter colorum immensitatem. Aramis cast a glance upon D'Artagnan to see what effect all this produced, and found his friend gaping enough to split his jaws. 
let us speak french my father said he to the jesuit monsieur d'artagnan will enjoy our conversation better yes replied d'artagnan i am fatigued with reading and all this latin confuses me certainly replied the jesuit a little put out while the curate greatly delighted turned upon d'artagnan a look full of gratitude well let us see what is to be derived from this gloss moses the servant of god he was but a servant pleased to understand moses blessed with the hands he held out both his arms while the hebrews beat their enemies and then he blessed them with his two hands besides what does the gospel say in ponite manus and not manum place the hands not the hand place the hands repeated the curate with a gesture st peter on the contrary of whom the popes are the successors continued the jesuit porige digitos present the fingers are you there now certes replied aramis in a pleased tone but the thing is subtle the fingers resumed the jesuit st peter blessed with the fingers the pope therefore blesses with the fingers and with how many fingers does he bless with three fingers to be sure one for the father one for the son and one for the holy ghost all crossed themselves d'artagnan thought it was proper to follow this example the pope is the successor of st peter and represents the three divine powers the rest ordines inferiores of the ecclesiastical hierarchy bless in the name of the holy archangels and angels the most humble clerks such as our deacons and sacristans bless with holy water sprinklers which resemble an infinite number of blessing fingers there is the subject simplified argumentum omni denudatum ornamento i could make of that subject two volumes the size of this continued the jesuit and in his enthusiasm he struck a st chrysostom in folio which made the table bend beneath its weight d'artagnan trembled certes said aramis i do justice to the beauties of this thesis but at the same time i perceive it would be overwhelming for me i had chosen this text tell me dear d'artagnan if it is not to your taste non inutile est desiderium in oblatione that is a little regret is not unsuitable in an offering to the lord stop there cried the jesuit for that thesis touches closely upon heresy there is a proposition almost like it in the augustinus of the heresiarch jansenius whose book will sooner or later be burned by the hands of the executioner take care my young friend you are inclining toward false doctrines my young friend you will be lost you will be lost said the curate shaking his head sorrowfully you approach that famous point of free will which is a mortal rock you face the insinuations of the pelagians and the semi pelagians but my reverend replied aramis a little amazed by the shower of arguments that poured upon his head how will you prove continued the jesuit without allowing him time to speak that we ought to regret the world when we offer ourselves to god listen to this dilemma god is god and the world is the devil to regret the world is to regret the devil that is my conclusion and that is mine also said the curate but for heaven's sake resumed aramis desideras diabolum unhappy man cried the jesuit he regrets the devil ah my young friend added the curate groaning do not regret the devil i implore you d'artagnan felt himself bewildered it seemed to him as though he were in a madhouse and was becoming as mad as those he saw he was however forced to hold his tongue from not comprehending half the language they employed but listen to me then resumed aramis with politeness mingled with a little impatience i do not say i regret no i will never pronounce that sentence which would not be orthodox the jesuit raised his hands toward heaven and the curate did the same no but pray grant me that it is acting with an ill grace to offer to the lord only that with which we are perfectly disgusted don't you think so d'artagnan i think so indeed cried he the jesuit and the curate quite started from their chairs this is the point of departure it is a syllogism the world is not wanting in attractions i quit the world then i make a sacrifice now the scripture says positively make a sacrifice unto the lord that is true said his antagonists and then said aramis 
pinching his ear to make it red, as he rubbed his hands to make them white. And then I made a certain rondeau upon it last year, which I showed to Monsieur Voiture, and that great man paid me a thousand compliments. A rondeau, said the Jesuit disdainfully. A rondeau, said the curate mechanically. Repeat it, repeat it, cried D'Artagnan. It will make a little change. Not so, for it is religious, replied Aramis. It is theology in verse. The devil, said D'Artagnan. Here it is, said Aramis, with a little look of diffidence, which, however, was not exempt from a shade of hypocrisy. Vous qui pleurez un passe plein de charme, et qui traînez des jours in fortune, tous vos malheurs se verront termine, quand à Dieu seul vous offrirez vos larmes, vous qui pleurez. You who weep for pleasures fled, while dragging on a life of care, all your woes will melt in air, if to God your tears are shed, you who weep. D'Artagnan and the curate appeared pleased. The Jesuit persisted in his opinion. Beware of a profane taste in your theological style. What says Augustine on this subject? Severus sit clericurum verbo. Yes, let the sermon be clear, said the curate. Now, hastily interrupted the Jesuit, on seeing that his acolyte was going astray. Now, your thesis would please the ladies. It would have the success of one of Monsieur Patrus's pleadings. Please, God, cried Aramis, transported. There it is, cried the Jesuit. The world still speaks within you in a loud voice. Altissima voce. You follow the world, my young friend, and I tremble lest grace prove not efficacious. Be satisfied, my reverend father, I can answer for myself. Mundane presumption! I know myself, father, my resolution is irrevocable. Then you persist in continuing that thesis? I feel myself called upon to treat that and no other. I will see about the continuation of it, and tomorrow I hope you will be satisfied with the corrections I shall have made in consequence of your advice. Work slowly, said the curate. We leave you in an excellent tone of mind. Yes, the ground is all sown, said the Jesuit, and we have not to fear that one portion of the seed may have fallen upon stone, another upon the highway, or that the birds of heaven have eaten the rest. Aves coeli comederunt ilam. Plague stifle you in your Latin, said D'Artagnan, who began to feel all his patience exhausted. Farewell, my son, said the curate, till tomorrow. Till tomorrow, rash youth, said the Jesuit. You promised to become one of the lights of the church. Heaven grant that this light prove not a devouring fire. D'Artagnan, who for an hour past had been gnawing his nails with impatience, was beginning to attack the quick. The two men in black rose, bowed to Aramis and D'Artagnan, and advanced toward the door. Bazin, who had been standing listening to all this controversy with a pious jubilation, sprang toward them, took the breviary of the curate and the missal of the Jesuit, and walked respectfully before them to clear their way. Aramis conducted them to the foot of the stairs, and then immediately came up again to D'Artagnan, whose senses were still in a state of confusion. When left alone, the two friends at first kept an embarrassed silence. It, however, became necessary for one of them to break it first, and as D'Artagnan appeared determined to leave that honour to his companion, Aramis said, "'You see that I am returned to my fundamental ideas.' Yes, efficacious grace has touched you, as that gentleman said just now. Oh, these plans of retreat have been formed for a long time. You have often heard me speak of them, have you not, my friend? Yes, but I confess I always thought you jested. With such things, oh, d'Artagnan! The devil! Why, people jest with death! And people are wrong, d'Artagnan, for death is the door which leads to perdition or to salvation. Granted. But if you please, let us not theologize, Aramis. You must have had enough for today. As for me, I have almost forgotten the little Latin I have ever known. Then I confess to you that I have eaten nothing since ten o'clock this morning. I am devilish hungry. We will dine directly, my friend. Only you must please to remember that this is Friday. Now, on such a day, I can neither eat flesh nor see it eaten. If you can be satisfied with my dinner, it consists of cooked tetragones and fruits. What do you mean by tetragones? asked D'Artagnan uneasily. I mean spinach, replied Aramis. But on your account I will add some eggs, and that is a serious infraction of the rule, for eggs are meat, since they engender chickens. This feast is not very succulent, but never mind, I will put up with it for the sake of remaining with you. 
"'I am grateful to you for the sacrifice,' said Aramis. "'But if your body be not greatly benefited by it, be assured your soul will.' "'And so, Aramis, you are decidedly going into the church? "'What will our two friends say? "'What will Monsieur de Treville say? "'They will treat you as a deserter, I warn you. "'I do not enter the church, I re-enter it. "'I deserted the church for the world, "'for you know that I forced myself when I became a musketeer. "'I? "'I know nothing about it. "'You don't know I quit the seminary? "'Not at all. "'This is my story, then.' Besides, the scriptures say, confess yourselves to one another, and I confess to you, D'Artagnan. And I give you absolution beforehand. You see, I'm a good sort of a man. Do not jest about holy things, my friend. Go on, then. I listen. I had been at the seminary from nine years old. In three days I should have been twenty. I was about to become an abbé, and all was arranged. One evening I went, according to custom, to a house which I frequented with much pleasure. When one is young, what can be expected? One is weak. An officer who saw me, with a jealous eye, reading the lives of the saints to the mistress of the house, entered suddenly and without being announced. That evening I had translated an episode of Judith, and had just communicated my verses to the lady, who gave me all sorts of compliments, and, leaning on my shoulder, was reading them a second time with me. Her pose, which I must admit was rather free, wounded this officer. He said nothing, but when I went out, he followed, and quickly came up with me. "'Monsieur d'Abbé,' said he, do you like blows with a cane? I cannot say, monsieur, answered I. No one has ever dared to give me any. Well, listen to me, then, monsieur d'Abbé. If you venture again into the house in which I have met you this evening, I will dare it myself. I really think I must have been frightened. I became very pale. I felt my legs fail me. I sought for a reply, but could find none. I was silent. The officer waited for his reply, and seeing it so long coming, he burst into a laugh, turned upon his heel, and re-entered the house. I returned to the seminary. I am a gentleman born, and my blood is warm, as you may have remarked, my dear D'Artagnan. The insult was terrible, and although unknown to the rest of the world, I felt it live and fester at the bottom of my heart. I informed my superiors that I did not feel myself sufficiently prepared for ordination, and at my request the ceremony was postponed for a year. I sought out the best fencing-master in Paris, I made an agreement with him to take a lesson every day, and every day for a year I took that lesson. Then, on the anniversary of the day on which I had been insulted, I hung my cassock on a peg, assumed the costume of a cavalier, and went to a ball given by a lady friend of mine, and to which I knew my man was invited. It was in the Rue des Francs Bourgeois, close to La Force. As I expected, my officer was there. I went up to him as he was singing a love ditty, and looking tenderly at a lady, and interrupted him exactly in the middle of the second couplet. Monsieur, said I, does it still displease you that I should frequent a certain house of la rue Payenne? And would you still cane me if I took it into my head to disobey you? The officer looked at me with astonishment, and then said, What is your business with me, monsieur? I do not know you. I am, said I, the little abbé who reads Lives of the Saints, and translates Judith into verse. Ah, ah! "'I recollect now,' said the officer, in a jeering tone. "'Well, what do you want with me?' "'I want you to spare time to take a walk with me.' "'Tomorrow morning, if you like, with the greatest pleasure.' "'No, not tomorrow morning, if you please, but immediately.' "'If you absolutely insist.' "'I do insist upon it.' "'Come, then. "'Ladies,' said the officer, "'do not disturb yourselves. "'Allow me time just to kill this gentleman, "'and I will return and finish the last couplet.' "'We went out.' I took him to the Rue Payenne, to exactly the same spot where a year before, at the very same hour, he had paid me the compliment I have related to you. It was a superb moonlit night. We immediately drew, and at the first pass I laid him stark dead. "'The devil!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Now,' continued Aramis, as the ladies did not see the singer come back, and as he was found in the Rue Payenne with a great sword-wound through his body, it was supposed that I had accommodated him thus— and the matter created some scandal which obliged me to renounce the cassock for a time. Athos, whose acquaintance I made about that period, and Porthos, who had, in addition to my lessons, taught me some effective tricks of fence, prevailed upon me to solicit the uniform of a musketeer. The king entertained great regard for my father, who had fallen at the siege of Arras, and the uniform was granted. You may understand that the moment has come for me to re-enter the bosom of the church." "'And why to-day, rather than yesterday or to-morrow? "'What has happened to you to-day to raise all these melancholy ideas?' 
This wound, my dear D'Artagnan, has been a warning to me from heaven. This wound? Bah! It's now nearly healed, and I'm sure it's not that which gives you the most pain. What then? said Aramis, blushing. You have one at heart, Aramis, one deeper and more painful, a wound made by a woman. The eye of Aramis kindled in spite of himself. Ah! said he, dissembling his emotion under a faint carelessness. Do not talk of such things, and suffer love pains. Vanitas vanitatum. According to your idea, then, my brain is turned. And for whom? For some grisette? Some chambermaid with whom I have trifled in some garrison? Fie! Pardon, my dear Aramis, but I thought you carried your eyes higher. Higher? And who am I to nurse such ambition? A poor musketeer, a beggar, an unknown, who hates slavery and finds himself ill-placed in the world. Aramis, Aramis, cried D'Artagnan, looking at his friend with an air of doubt. Dust I am, and to dust I return. Life is full of humiliations and sorrows, continued he, becoming still more melancholy. All the ties which attach him to life break in the hand of man, particularly the golden ties. Oh, my dear D'Artagnan, resumed Aramis, giving to his voice a slight tone of bitterness, trust me, conceal your wounds when you have any. Silence is the last joy of the unhappy. Beware of giving any one the clue to your griefs. The curious suck our tears as flies suck the blood of a wounded heart. Alas, my dear Aramis, said D'Artagnan, in his turn heaving a profound sigh, that is my story you are relating. How? Yes, a woman whom I love, whom I adore, has just been torn from me by force. I do not know where she is, or whither they have conducted her. She is perhaps a prisoner. She is perhaps dead. Yes, but you have at least this consolation, that you can say to yourself she has not quit you voluntarily, that if you learn no news of her, it is because all communication with you is interdicted, while I... Well? Nothing, replied Aramis. Nothing. So you renounce the world, then, for ever. That is a settled thing. A resolution registered. For ever. You are my friend to-day. Tomorrow you will be no more to me than a shadow, or rather, even, you will no longer exist. As for the world, it is a sepulchre, and nothing else. The devil! All this is very sad, which you tell me. What will you? My vocation commands me. It carries me away. D'Artagnan smiled, but made no answer. Aramis continued. And yet... While I do belong to the earth, I wish to speak of you, of our friends. And on my part, said D'Artagnan, I wish to speak of you, but I find you so completely detached from everything. To love, you cry, fie, friends are shadows, the world is a sepulchre. Alas, you will find it so yourself, said Aramis, with a sigh. Well then, let us say no more about it, said D'Artagnan, and let us burn this letter, which no doubt announces to you some fresh infidelity of your grisette or your chambermaid. "'What letter?' cried Aramis eagerly. "'A letter which was sent to your abode in your absence, and which was given to me for you.' "'But from whom is that letter?' "'Oh, from some heartbroken waiting woman, some desponding grisette, from Madame de Chevreuse's chambermaid, perhaps, who was obliged to return to Tours with her mistress, and who, in order to appear smart and attractive, stole some perfumed paper, and sealed her letter with a duchess's coronet. "'What do you say?' "'Hold! I must have lost it!' said the young man maliciously, pretending to search for it. But, fortunately, the world is a sepulchre. The men, and consequently the women, are but shadows, and love is a sentiment to which you cry, Fie! Fie! D'Artagnan! D'Artagnan! cried Aramis. You're killing me! Well, here it is at last, said D'Artagnan, as he drew the letter from his pocket. Aramis made a bound, seized the letter, read it, or rather devoured it, his countenance radiant. This same waiting maid seems to have an agreeable style, said the messenger, carelessly. Thanks, D'Artagnan, thanks, cried Aramis, almost in a state of delirium. She was forced to return to Tours. She is not faithless. She still loves me. Come, my friend, come, let me embrace you. Happiness almost stifles me. The two friends began to dance around the venerable St. Chrysostom, kicking about famously the sheets of the thesis which had fallen on the floor. At that moment, Bazin entered with the spinach and the omelette. "'Be off, you wretch!' cried Aramis, throwing his skullcap in his face. 
return whence you came take back those horrible vegetables and that poor kickshaw order a larded hare a fat capon mutton leg dressed with garlic and four bottles of old burgundy bazin who looked at his master without comprehending the cause of this change in a melancholy manner allowed the omelette to slip into the spinach and the spinach on to the floor now this is the moment to consecrate your existence to the king of kings said d'artagnan if you persist in offering him a civility non inutile desiderium oblationi go to the devil with your latin let us drink my dear d'artagnan morbleu let us drink while the wine is fresh let us drink heartily and while we do so tell me a little of what is going on in the world yonder End of chapter 26